Hello, everyone. We are in our second session of the Great Lakes Games. We're going to give it a couple minutes to allow people to kind of uh, slowly trickle in. But I want to just welcome you and welcome our two presenters, Jen and Mark, which I'll introduce here in a minute. Okay. Oh, great. at the bottom of your screen or your phone. We'll go ahead and keep monitoring those and answer them throughout the session or at the very end. Um, otherwise, we do have a chat function. Please make sure to use the questions in the Q&A function instead. But please use the chat to say hi, say where you're from, or connect with other attendees. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce your presenters. Mark Miller, Department Chair of Orthotics and Prosthetics at California State University, Dominguez Hills, and Jennifer Lucharovich, Physical Therapist, Instructor at California State University, Dominguez Hills, the Master Program for Orthotics and Prosthetics, and also a Medical Classifier for Track and Field and Table Tennis. Take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Um, this is one of the few times that you'll see me not in a cap uh, at a sporting event. I know it's unusual for all of us to be sitting here. Um, so glad to have you in attendance. Um, I'll be doing most of the presenting and I've invited Mark to just jump in. So hopefully he won't be shy and interject um, as need be. Okay. Our intention for this lecture is to just talk about sport specific orthotics and prosthetics for standing athletes. And it is not our goal to make you experts in this field. Um, it's to help you learn the vocabulary, to better communicate for better outcomes for athletes. So this is mostly geared towards um, our coaches and our athletes and parents. Um, but if any of you are in the medical field or have other specific questions, we're happy to go a little bit more down the rabbit hole as we go. So please don't be shy about using the chats. Um, as we continue here, so we have people helping us out. Um, if you ask a question, I might have a bit of a, a delay um, to look at all the screens, but we will, I promise we'll get to your questions as best that we can. Okay. So with that said, our objectives, again, that we want to go over today 
Um, first, just some basic terminology. So what is an orthosis and a prosthesis? Um, so you're comfortable with those terminologies. Thinking about identifying the three considerations for a sport-specific O&P device. Um, and again, it's the vocabulary to communicate your needs um, with healthcare professionals to help bridge that gap. And then we're gonna talk about how um, health conditions um, might relate to the eligible impairments that would make someone eligible for Paralympic competition and who might be needing a device and why. A lot of what we have today, we're trying to have videos um, and case examples. So um, I anticipate there might be some video glitches, but we did our best to at least put the YouTube links up. So if the video doesn't work, you can watch on your free time. So first things first, we're gonna talk about a few definitions. So in orthosis, or the plural of that is an orthosis, um, is a basically a brace, is the easiest way to think about this device. So it's designed to help either support um, or provide function to a body part that is not working in its ideal way. So most of you are probably familiar with an AFO or an ankle foot orthosis, as you can kind of see on the shared screen right here. Um, but an orthosis could also be something as simple as a knee brace. So this is a sport specific type of performance knee brace, also called a knee orthosis. So beyond just the device, so the device is to support the body, but we have experts who understand the materials, the fit, um, and the purpose behind all these braces, and that would be an orthotist. So when we use the term orthotics, we're really talking about something bigger than just the brace, but it's the decision making. And that is the part that I think as coaches and athletes, we can be more involved to help improve the outcome of what that brace is trying to do by providing the background of what the sport needs the device to do. Now a prosthesis, or the plural of that is prostheses, um, is going to be something that is going to replace a missing body part. So most commonly you're going to see this in our population with limb deficiency, where we have a prosthetic leg to replace the body part that is not there. So Again, we have different parts of the prosthesis that we will talk about and how that they all work together to try to replace the natural anatomy and the function of that body part that is now missing. So if you look kind of at the picture here, I have a side view of a prosthetic leg and I have a front view. So both of these devices are for someone who has a below knee amputation or a transtibial amputation. And there's a couple parts that are important just to be aware of. So the first is gonna be the socket. So the socket is the part where the residual limb or the stump is going to interact with the rest of the prosthesis. So typically those are gonna kind of mimic the shape of that residual limb. So again, a front view here and a side view here. Then we have a prosthetic foot, which if you guys have seen for daily use, you might see this fancy foot shell, um, which is actually just a covering, but you can see that the actual prosthetic foot is inside of that, okay? So obviously different than what we see when we come to running um, and we talk about blade runners, which we will get to. And then we have a part in between the socket and the foot, um, which can either be a rigid pylon like you see here, or it can have the ability to allow for some rotation, to allow for some shock absorption. There are different features we can put in the device to help it mimic what that body part needs to do for sport. So the other really important things when we talk about prosthetics, besides just those pieces that we just labeled, is an idea called suspension. So that is how the device is gonna stay on the limb. So it is going to do that by trying to grab the anatomy that's still there on the residual limb or the stump. Um, I don't know if any of you have got to see in sports, we've seen this go badly where during running a leg goes flying off um, because the suspension wasn't adequate. But there are different ways that the leg is designed, the prosthetic leg is designed to stay on whether it's using suction because of um, pressure of the air, but it's really about how it stays on. 
In the last slide, we already talked about kind of the functional parts of the device, which we call components. So again, that could be those special features um, and what they're designed to do. But the other important thing that we want to talk about a little bit is alignment. So when we're replacing a body parts, we have to choose how long to make this, um, this prosthesis. We have to choose how much we want the knee to be bent or straight, what position we want someone in. By adjusting the alignment, we can make a limb more stable or more mobile. Um, we can allow certain motions to happen or to control them, but these are all the tools that we have. Besides just you know, the parts that you purchase, um, this is the art of having this fit well. So Mark, anything you wanna jump in with here? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later on, you know, kind of the whole idea of a prosthetist and an orthotist, the persons that actually kind of specialize in making these components. But it, it's amazing how much we can change the performance of a device. And, and we have the ability to kind of put the prosthetic foot wherever we need to put it, the alignment wherever we need to. There's a hundred different components we can kind of put in there. And we can do all this stuff on our own, but we're not going to know what to do and what the outcome should be until we talk to the athlete and until we talk to the coach. Um, so we can make it and we can make anything and any material, which is great. Um, so it's going to be a balance of having an understanding of the biomechanics, which Jen's going to go through next, and how we can manipulate that and what kind of device we use. Just because you see somebody in one type of prosthetic foot doesn't mean it's right for your athlete. So we really want to be able to have this communication. And there's a whole subclass of allied health professionals called prosthetists and orthotists. And this is all we do. We literally just make braces and just make prosthetic limbs. And then we work with physical therapists, recreational therapists, coaches to try to figure out what's the best optimal alignment to meet the outcomes you have for that particular person. Because, you know, despite what some of the um, controversies are that are out there, no, no prosthesis or orthosis is going to do the sport activities for a person. This is still an athlete that's just using a device to help them be at their maximal best, but it does not do the work for them. It doesn't replace those hours in the gym. So we want to, again, make this device um, really specific to the sport needs. And we'll talk about that a little as we go. So a big part of all of this, besides learning this, um, this terminology, is understanding why and what role these devices are supposed to provide. So again, it's either going to substitute in the case of a prosthesis or it's going to enhance the ability of the human body to move in the case of an orthosis. So how the body moves depends on what the sport needs it to move. So we need to understand how best to do this based on what those demands are. Um, we can, again, by making adjustments um, in whether it's the component selection, the materials involved, all of these different features can be adjusted to kind of control a certain motion or allow a different motion um, to help what that person needs for sports. And we can also do it to prevent motion or immobilize an area that's not moving well. So that's regardless whether it's an orthosis or prosthesis, this is what they are designed to do. So we have lots of different materials. We have some materials that will help when they bend, kind of store energy, and then as it releases, kind of give some of that energy back to mimic what a muscle might be doing if it was functioning on a different body. Um, and again, we can use our alignment to make decisions about how much we want um, a body part to move in a certain direction. So if we want it to allow lateral motion, we can set up the alignment to encourage us to improve that weight shifting laterally, if that's what we need for the sport. We can rotate the position of the foot. We can help rotate a prosthesis outward to give more stability. All of these things are things that we can manipulate if we know as a coach or an athlete what you need to help you perform better. And the, the really um, gratifying part of what we can do with this is it's pretty much instantaneous. So if we want to get a little bit more propulsion from someone who's getting out of the starting blocks, if they're, you know, whether they're using a brace or a prosthesis, we can manipulate the toe or plantar flex the toe two degrees and they may get 
20 more joules of energy coming off of the, the blocks themselves. We can invert the foot one degree. We can go, we can do it instantaneously. So when we know we have a, a physical therapy regime where we're gonna have to strengthen muscles or create more balance or create more perception, that takes days, weeks, months to get. Where in this case, we could actually change some things with changing material out and get an instant change in performance right away. So there's a lot of variance we can do with these things and, and it can happen very quickly. So how these devices work are really based on um, principles of biomechanics. And that's really just what we know about how the world works, um, the forces acting on the body, what the body needs to do internally. Um, so one of those things that we just wanna mention is the principle of a three-point pressure system. So again, if we want to control what motions are allowed or what motions are prevented, we can do that by applying forces at different points relative to the joint. So again, we can have one force acting at the joint surface to push it in this direction, and we can have other forces moving the opposite direction that are all gonna to contribute to the same motion, which would be taking a leg from a bent knee position like in this picture and going and straightening it in this position. So these are the basic principles that help control what forces are acting on the joint. So again, if a joint's unstable, we can protect it by minimizing some of those shear forces and providing more stability to help support what the anatomy is not doing on its own. So again, three-point pressure system, we don't just apply and put pressure in one area, we dissipate that force um, by applying those forces over kind of longer lever arms as you see in the photo. There's also a lot that we can do with helping to control kind of angular forces, um, helping that we make sure we don't lose that momentum as we're trying to shift our weight from foot to foot, to, to help continue to build that forward progression towards our target um, or towards kind of that, that end line where we're gonna release our shot put um, at the toe box. So again, by changing how the device interacts with the human body, we can manipulate these forces to allow us to maintain as much momentum and forward motion to maximize the ability for sport performance to happen. So as Mark mentioned, you know, the, the one thing that we really wanna talk about as um, instructors at a program who are training future orthotists and prosthetists, they understand the biomechanic principles of the device. They understand the materials but they might not understand adaptive sports and what is really needed and how optimal movement is for the sport. Because some sports vary significantly um, from their able-bodied able counterparts. Uh, some are only exist in Paralympics, so that's where we need to come together. But you don't have to be an expert in biomechanics because an orthotist prosthetist is trained to do that. So this is where kind of we can come together. So, Again, an orthotist prosthetist um, has to go through a graduate program, a master's degree, and then they have to sit for a board examination to be certified, but it doesn't mean that they are sports specialists. It means they understand human movement, but most of the emphasis for training is on walking. So, cause that is the most common form of movement that we do throughout the day. So we want to teach both orthotist prosthetists to have the sport application, but also coaches and athletes, how to communicate with them for what those needs are so that they can adjust those biomechanical principles to have a better outcome. Yeah. And the, the profession of orthotics and prosthetics is it, it, pretty unique because we're, we're taking principles of engineering, biomechanics, philosophy, psychomotor skills, gait analysis, and we're taking that all and trying to create a, a human performance device. Um, so with that, you know, we're basically blacksmiths when we kind of started out making prosthetics and braces and, and pieces and parts to support things and then finding out how to enhance that. Uh, and Stephanie had a question about, uh, you know, are all orthotists, prosthetists, orthotists and prosthetists, a brace maker and an artificial limb maker. Um, right now uh, in the current education with our master's degree, yes, we do get orthotic and prosthetic training, but most individuals have a specialization. My specialization is lower limb prosthetics. 
Um, I typically do higher end uh, lower limb prosthetics, like hip disarticulations and, and above the knee amputations where I kind of specialize. My wife, who happens to also be an uh, orthoprosthetist, she's a pediatric specialist and she does a lot more orthotics with pediatrics. So we have a lot of different specializations in the areas, but we understand how to do the device. But again, we just don't understand what you particularly need for your athlete. So when we're thinking about trying to improve sport performance, we have to think of a kind of collaborative team, all of us with our different skill sets coming together for the sake of the athlete performance. And sometimes that athlete performance is a team performance, which is okay too. So what we want to do is we want to kind of think about three things together. We want to think about what the athlete is able to do. So where do they need support? Because um, again, to be eligible for Paralympics, typically there is a movement impairment. So those eligible impairments, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, what do they need support in? And then specifically, what does the sport, what's ideal for the sport? Is it speed? Is it agility? Is it moving only forward? Or is it multi-directional, where I need to be able to go forward, backward, and sideways? That's a completely different skill and movement qualities that I need in the device to provide. And finally, what do I need from materials in the design to help support that? So when we think about creating that ideal device, it's never going to happen if we just have input from one of the people on our team. So again, an athlete who's new might not have the sophistication to know what an ideal movement is like yet. So for a new athlete, we might need more input from coaches who have the experience, who understand the sport, and where we're trying to take that athlete. But elite athletes who have been doing the sport and are really kind of masters of their motor pattern or their movement might be able to provide really sophisticated input of, hey, when I am, um, when I am pushing down, when I'm cycling, I notice that there's this little hiccup and I feel like I have a little leg, like I'm losing suspension in my prosthesis. They're able to provide that input. Um, and again, the other people on the healthcare team, whether it's a physical therapist, uh, an orthotist, prosthetist, is going to talk about how that person is going to move and how we maximize that movement based on the device. So um, we also need to be aware of the rules of the sport. So sport officials or people who are, so coaches, if you aren't as familiar with the rule book, I know they're very thick and daunting, um, but there are limits to what we're allowed to do for device to assist for Paralympic sport. So those are all the things we want to keep in mind. And to truly maximize potential of the athlete, we want to consider all of these variables together and have a nice comprehensive look on what we need and who we are fitting this device for to make sure all those match. So anytime we're talking about a collaboration between different people, the important thing is to know we all have our expertise. We do not have to be experts at everything. Nobody has time for that. Um, those of you who know me know I'm a intense, lifelong learner, but I, I do not expect to know it all. We have a team for a reason that we can all put our heads together and our expertise to come up with a solution, but it's all about communication, communicating your different ideas, being open-minded, um, building that relationship where we can communicate in a free way to meet our goals. And again, this should be a joint decision-making process that we have input from all the parties. So again, when we think about things like the CAF equipment grants, which are fantastic, but we have to think about timing. If they are a brand new athlete and they don't know what sport or what event they want to do, do we want to get them a device knowing that all these sports have different demands? Maybe we want to wait and let them use their daily devices that maybe aren't ideal for sport yet to help them figure out what we really need this device to be able to provide. Because as all of you I'm sure know, these are one-time grants. Um, so we really want to help make those last as long as possible. And part of that comes with the evolution of that athlete in that sport. But if it's a new athlete and we really want to go after these grants, that's okay too. In that case, we really want to come together as a team and try to think not just what that athlete needs right now, but what they might need in the future and where we think we're headed with this. So 
Um, as I mentioned, our objectives, one of the most important things we really wanted to cover today was the sport specific considerations. And here are the three things we want to think about. First of all, what are the sport rules? Are they allowed to use an orthosis or a prosthesis? If they're not, well then we probably better be aware of that before we start talking about how this could improve their performance. So recreational activities are not gonna have the same burden as if you go to desert challenge games, um, which we have officials from all over the world that are gonna be there and enforcing these rules. So we wanna think about first, what's allowed? Um, even if a prosthesis orthosis is allowed, are there limitations for what it can and cannot do? Um, so again, that knowledge of the sport rules is important to go over. The second thing we want to make sure we're aware of is what are the functional demands of the sport? So again, what skills are needed? Do I want, um, if I'm doing a sport, do I need top speed? Do I need to build up speed to get to a point and then I need stability to be able to release an implement? Um, do I need to move in multiple directions? Do I need to have my feet planted and be able to rotate my body on top of planted feet? All of these um, require specific joints or adaptations or components to allow this. So we need to understand the sport and what it should do. Um, and another important question here is, will an orthosis or prosthesis improve sport performance? Some sports do not need um, a specific device to improve performance. They might need something else like a racing wheelchair or something else. Um, it doesn't have to be an orthosis or a prosthesis. So that's okay if it's not needed for the sport. We want sport performance. We don't necessarily want everyone to wear a device. Um, and the third thing to consider is the athlete. So again, an athlete may have a classification. They may have an impairment, but the athlete is going to have a different body shape, they're going to have different skills that they are good at um, that are going to help you as a coach or as an athlete think about your strategy or your technique for what you want to be able to do for that sport. So beyond just what the ideal movement is for the sport, what are your strengths as an athlete? So how do we take the device and try to maximize your strengths or control those weaknesses that are taking away from your ability to shine? So we don't wanna just create a good device. We wanna create a good device that is the right device for the athletes and meets the needs of the sport. Okay, so we're gonna go over these in a little bit of detail, um, but first I thought it'd be good to show a couple of examples. I know we're all visual. So there are plenty of sports that do not use an ONP device, so an orthosis or a prosthesis. So obvious example is swimming. Um, it's not allowed, plus it adds drag. There's other issues that are gonna be. So with swimming, even with multiple limb um, deficiency, we don't see people using devices. Um, sitting volleyball is another great example where you see the, the bench now becomes a holder place for a bunch of prosthetic legs um, or different devices. It's not commonly used because you're seated and you don't need that stability of those distal limbs um, to stand. Again, other examples of sports that, that don't need um, devices are, again, I know we're talking about standing athletes, but let's think about seated athletes. Some of our athletes who might use a, an orthosis for walking in daily activities might choose to compete in track in a racing wheelchair. And do they wear their, uh, do they wear their braces on their legs? They don't because it, again, it adds weight and slows things down. I love that Beth recognized Moxie, the dog there. Um, again, uh, wheelchair basketball, sled hockey are sports that we do not um, expect people to have a device on. They typically are just going to have that chair to help them move. And that is what's best for the sport, and that is okay. So again, what they might use in daily life might be different than the sport because I don't wear the same shoes to the gym, to the opera, not that I go to the opera. Um, but again, I'm going to choose the right attire to support what I'm doing functionally in orthosis and prosthesis is the same way. Now we also have examples of really unique solutions that are only to meet the needs of a sport. So if we look kind of on the far right screen, you can see someone doing wheelchair tennis. And again, I know we're talking about standing athletes, but 
this is a really brilliant design. They have the sockets, but they have no other components, but the socket is attached actually to the wheelchair. This allows the athlete to kneel on his right leg and put weight through this leg while maintaining an erect trunk position. So his hips are straight. He's not seated and stuck in that um, seated position. This, in, this um, intervention allowed him to be able to get better rotation through his whole trunk, including his hips. We also see um, a really well-known cyclist from Spain here who, instead of wearing a prosthesis and attaching it to a gear, he just has an open, what looks like a socket, but it's just again attached to the frame so he can push his residual limb or his stump into the frame to help balance and support. And here's another example of a sport specific orthosis for cycling. So again, still allows the ability to clip, maintains that ankle position, um, but you can still see that this is kind of like outside the shoe. It's a unique modification to allow cycling while wearing the device. So we don't have to think inside the box. If we work as a team, we can come up with really creative solutions that are allowed um, that help maximize performance for our athletes. Um, beyond just your typical prostheses, um, people with limb loss can use unique adaptations such as these that we see for archery. So again, on the left side here, you have what's called a release brace where it allows the athlete to kind of have it attached to the opposite shoulder. So there's tension and then to release it, it's a little flick button to allow the release. So there's no upper extremity prosthesis that will do that function. So we can build it in actually to the equipment um, to provide that support. Or the low tech version on your right is just a simple elbow brace that has basically a D-ring um, with tension to allow the person to use that strong shoulder and that elbow to pull back for tension before they release. So again, we can think outside the box when we work together because we understand what we need and we can come up with creative solutions. Um, again, some sports have very specific demands. So in the previous slide, we saw archery um, where it was the pull hands that had modification. In this case, this is the stabilizing hand. So it has different needs, but this one allows a nice support. So it actually contours around the frame um, of the bow and allows him to pull with his good arm and maintain stability there. But there are rules in how it can be attached. Um, so you can see that it's just a very basic attachment because it can't be rigidly fixed. So again, collaboration and understanding the rules is an important thing. In the middle here, we have a picture. So again, this is the daily prosthesis that this athlete uses, but you can see different versions of cycling specific prostheses that actually have toe clips on these different designs. So there's a lot of um, choices you can make about how long that lever arm should be on the clip. Should it be directly under the knee joints? Should it be a little bit offset and forward? Um, these are all things that we can do to improve how smooth that cycling pattern is. Um, and again, there's great innovations that are specific for sports, um, such as the BioAdapt company has come up with a really great hydraulic knee that allows someone to stay, even with an amputation above the knee, to stay in that bent kind of um, athletic posture that's needed for um, downhill activities. So there are options out there that are specific and other ones that we can be creative and problem solve um, to come up with a solution. Then we have you know, unique sports like paratriathlon where the same athlete is going to have to swap components, swap legs to meet the needs of the different events that's part of the sport. So you know, here's a picture of Melissa Stockwell, who hopefully you guys have been following. Um, but showing kind of again what she kind of uses for her daily leg on the far side there where she's half in uniform. We can see her cycling setup. So again, here you can see there's actually a longer part of a foot. So it's not directly attached under. So a little bit longer of a lever arm where it attaches to the pedal. But we have a knee joint and we have that socket kind of coming up here. Um, and then we also have her running blade when she switches to her running specific device for that part of triathlon. 
We also have sports um, such as table tennis that allow the athlete to choose if they want to wear a device or not. So some sports, um, we don't see that there is the ability to be competitive um, and everyone kind of chooses to use a device or chooses not to. Um, but some sports allow people to choose based on what works best for them. So um, again, for table tennis, we can see here, we have an athlete here that's a class six athlete. So um, in the standing classes that has her racket attached directly to a socket on her upper limb. She also has a lower limb prosthesis, which she is using um, without a lot of knee bending. So this is kind of a traditional setup um, that you would see for daily use. We have another athlete here from China who chooses not to use a device, um, just simply a forearm crutch to provide that nice wide base of support um, to allow him to be able to return the ball and move quickly. Um, one of the most probably creative setups that I have seen um, comes from Ukraine. Uh, so this is an athlete who has an amputation through the knee. And he has it actually set up that his prosthetic side um, is probably about four to six inches shorter than his sound limb. So the side that's intact is longer. This allows him to be able to stay in that kind of bent posture with his pelvis being level. And then he has a forearm crutch over here just to provide a little extra stability so he can take a quick step to get return on the backhand side. So again, this is never a decision that an orthotist, a, a prosthetist, a PT, or a coach makes without athlete input. We do want the athlete to have input. All of those people need to have a voice in these decisions to optimize performance. And again, when we come to recreational activities, we don't have the same rules and regulations. So there are great things we can do um, to be very creative. So on your left, that's an example of a type of foot that would be used for uh, mountain climbing when it's icy. So it has nice little toe picks to kind of dig into ice and snow. Um, we also have some very creative CrossFit adaptations that allow things like handstands or wheelbarrow racing, as in this photo. Um, and I just want to point out, if you notice, there's even a hook here that allow for um, doing pull-ups um, and other places to clip to do resisted cable activities. So um, he kind of created that on his own, which is very impressive. And we have, again, very specific sports um, designs for a terminal device, which is kind of the part that attaches in an upper limb amputation that attaches here to replace the function of the hand. So again, while softball is not a Paralympic sport, it's a great recreational activity, America's pastime. Um, and you can see that they have, you know, specific uh, adaptations for catching, for holding on to a bat, um, or to hold on to a ball to throw. So there are solutions out there as long as we know what the athlete wants to be able to do and, we, and what they have to work with and we can kind of problem solve that. So we talked a little bit with those picture examples of sports that maybe use or don't use devices. Now we want to kind of take the time to kind of think through a little bit about um, the demands of sports and what technical things we want to improve for the athlete's individual performance. So again, with athlete's technique, our big questions is, what is the coaching strategy? So the same sport, the same events for all athletes, but each athlete has certain things they're really good at. So how do we highlight those skills and minimize those weaknesses based on the design or setup of the device um, to allow that? So again, what do we want to highlight? What do we want to control? So first, let's talk a little bit about the athlete. So um, I hope all of you on this call, since you're not new to adaptive sports, are familiar that there are 10 eligible impairments um, that allow an athlete to potentially be eligible to compete in Paralympic sport. Okay, so those are hypertonia, um, where maybe there is a problem with the central nervous system, so we have too much tone in the body, where the muscles um, resist movement. So regardless of what you want the body to do, there is a resistance within the muscles. Ataxia, which is a type of problem with coordination. 
um, where we have to control these motions and do it in a nice smooth manner, a repeatable manner can be a problem. Um, Aphytosis, uh, which again is a problem with the central nervous system where we see that the body just has trouble staying still. So again, we don't, despite what we want our body to do, um, it might have other ideas for movement. Limb deficiency, um, again, is probably, you know, one of the most uh, photographed or um, hallmarks kind of of the Paralympic movement because it's easy for people to understand while looking. Um, and that's where there is either a amputation of a limb or a shortening of the limb due to a congenital birth defect. So we could have, um, this is typically going to be um, your population that's going to be using a prosthesis. Impaired passive range of motion just means that the joint is lacking movement. Um, and this is not, again, because of what the muscle is doing. It's the joint itself has some um, loss of motion. So there's a hard stop um, or a tightness that prevents that joint from going through the normal motion um, that we'd expect in the human body. Moving to the right column, impaired muscle power. Um, there's a variety of reasons we could have impaired muscle power. So hopefully you guys are thinking of some of those health conditions um, that would uh, most commonly that we think of is a spinal cord injury, um, spina bifida, um, or something like polio where we see weakness in maybe just one limb. But there's a lot of different reasons that someone could have impaired muscle power. Um, leg length difference is pretty self-explanatory, but it's usually a very significant difference requiring a shoe um, elevation. Uh, short stature, number eight listed there, again, is going to be, there's multiple health conditions that could be eligible under short stature, but there are specific rules for what that can look like. And finally, visually impaired and intellectually impaired. So we have 10 eligible impairments, but in reality, only a few of them are likely going to be people that might need an orthosis or a prosthesis. So those are going to be the ones that are not struck out. So that's your hypertonicity your ataxia, your limb deficiency, and your impaired muscle power are going to be the primary users in our standing categories um, for an orthosis or prosthesis. So now when we start thinking about the sport-specific demands, okay, so we talked a little bit about how the athlete, the type of impairments that athlete might have, we need to understand that a, an athlete who in a daily practice is using an orthosis or prosthesis, it is set up to allow a person to walk. So if you look on the left hand um, column here, these are the motions that the joint needs to have for walking. So we have as much as 20 degrees of hip extension, so that's that leg being behind me. And I also need to be able to bring my leg forward and bring that thigh forward about 25 degrees, okay? When we get into running, we don't see people putting their leg as far back. A lot of the motion is more in front. So we see more hip flexion and less hip extension, okay? In the knee, for normal walking, we don't need to be able to bend the knee very much. But when we're running, we bend the knee um, um, much significantly more, more than one and a half times the amount of knee bending is needed to allow us to kind of get that motion and get that flight phase. So we need to understand that when we think about a, um, our device. And finally, the most important thing to think about is really how different the actions at the foot are for sport. So when we're just looking at the difference between walking and running, in walking, we have 10 degrees of dorsiflexion, so that's bringing the ankle up and we have 15 degrees of the ankle pointing down. However, when we get to running, we know when running, we're, our weight is much more on the ball of our foot to allow us to keep our momentum moving forward. So we need a lot more of that pointed toe or plantar flexion. So we want to be up on kind of those, the ball of your foot and the front foot, um, your, your forefoot um, or your toes and your um, ball of your foot. So there are different things when we think about what we need an orthosis to do for our standing athletes who are running, okay? We talked first a little bit about how the demands at the ankle joint are different. So if we look at 
you know, the example here on the right of your traditional AFO for walking. So this is an ankle foot orthosis or an ankle kind of brace. It is typically going to be set up, you know, with just a tiny bit of plantar flexion. This one is an off the shelf. So it has zero degrees of motion. So the ankle is kind of just in that normal standing position. But if you're a coach or an athlete and you wanted to run, if my ankle was stuck at 90 degrees, that would not be a good thing because it doesn't help me get my weight onto the toes into that normal running position. So that's where we can have a sport specific type of device such as the IDEO, so the Intrepid Dynamic Exoskeletal Orthosis. Um, so again, the big thing you can see between the two is this plantar flexion angle. This is set up um, more ideal for running. So allow the weight to be right here, kind of through the forefoot. So notice how I have this angle at the ankle, and then I have an opposite angle where my toes can be flat so I can stay up and supported in that position on my forefoot. This one also has, if you notice the color difference, it's because the material is different. So this is carbon fiber and it has a strut in the back. So when that strut's compressed, the material is gonna allow it to store energy. And then as that heel and my weight goes onto my foot, it gives me that energy back to help me get a big step with my opposite leg. So it's gonna return some of that energy. Normally it's to be done by our calf muscle. But in the absence of that ankle being able to move or have the strength, this device will help return some of that energy. Okay. Um, so again, the alignment or that angulation change for running is hugely beneficial. So using, if you have seen a new athlete or a really young athlete running in their daily AFOs or ankle foot orthoses, um, we see they're very flat footed when they run because they don't, the device is not set up to be in a running alignment. Um, with that said, running alignments are great for running, but it's really hard to stand still or to balance in them. So that's where you might, as a coach, have to be at the start or finish line to help them kind of get set up. Another thing that we can adjust for an orthosis is the stiffness. So if we want to have a thicker material, it can provide um, more stiffness, which allows potentially more energy to return. Um, we might want more stiffness if we don't want it to be really flexible, so we want to have better control. These are things that we can adjust. Um, stiffness is typically something that we adjust based on a person's body weight, um, but for sport, typically, whether it's a prosthesis or orthosis, we give more um, stiffness because we're getting more forces, more aggressive forces coming through that limb that it needs to control. Um, there's also, again, multiple types of design. So again, the, all of these come and attach in different ways to the human body. So again, you can see in this design here, it looks like a shin pad, and then it has a little bit of support to the foot plate on the lateral or outside part of the foot. This device in the middle actually attaches to the shoe. So it's not even inside the shoe. Oops, sorry about that. Um, this attaches to the outside here. Um, so if someone is having trouble getting their um, foot inside the shoe, this is a nice option. Um, typically, this, uh, this type of design is great for walking. I haven't seen quite as much success for sport yet, but um, I hope to be proved wrong. Um, and again, you can see here another one that's kind of a hybrid where we have some anterior support on the front part of that lower leg. And again, we see that strut instead of being on the back side coming to that outside part of the foot. So there's a lot that we can change in the design to help meet the demands for running. But keep in mind, most of these setups are really designed for forward motion. So if I have a sport that needs lateral cutting, um, or diagonal movements, I might have to change the design to better support the foot to move in those different planes. And, and this is where um, additive manufacturing or 3D printing is kind of coming into play uh, with sport designs. I mean, we've, we've been stuck in um, kind of a materials problem for a while, and you're using uh, polypropylene plastics and uh, other materials to kind of get there, and then carbon graphites have, have come along and be able to kind of change the strut design and going through. And now with the um, inclusion of additive manufacturing, 
we can do more testing like finite element analysis on the device before we even put it on the athlete and then be able to figure out what kind of stretch system we want, what kind of torsional control that we want to do this. And, and this is going to be a newer area where we all have to kind of play together and try to figure out, Hey, how can we do this? What, you know, what's your real goal that you want to do and how can I make a device that's going to allow for that only two degrees of motion in this plane, but eight degrees in the other plane. So you can really do the motion that you want to have occur. Um, so I have a couple of videos here, which we'll see if we can get them to play. Um, and they're going to play without sound, so I can kind of talk over the top. But the YouTube links are there. But even for people that have a fused ankle, where they have no ankle motion, the, um, these type of orthoses really allow them to run quite normally. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of leg on the video. But do you see how the athlete's able to stay up on his toe? Look at that nice symmetry, nice big steps, good turnover. And again, all of this is because it's just designed in a way to allow for running. But you notice the walking part looks a little bit weird because it's designed for running. Um, here's another video that just shows someone wearing um, a sport specific orthosis for jumping. So again, do you see how she was able to keep her weight onto that toe? Let me see if I can play that one more time for you. Um, for the jump. So again, that energy return is really critical for some of those activities. Okay. And a traditional um, kind of AFO is not going to allow that support to do that movement. So now let's talk a little bit about running. So when we talk about prostheses for running, so now we have someone with limb deficiency who needs something to replace what we need that body to do for running. So the thing to be aware of is there are different ways for the foot part, which we call the blade, to be attached to the socket. So here's an example of posterior mounting where the foot attaches behind the socket. So this is great if you have a type of foot that you like, um, but you don't have enough space to the floor. So the person has a really long stump or residual limb. Um, so we can attach it behind to allow it to still do what it needs to do. Or we can have it directly underneath. So again, how we attach it to the socket depends on um, the design of the blade. So if you notice, there are going to be different types of curves. So this particular foot has, um, has a type of C curve that really goes posterior before it goes down, um, whereas this type of foot is going to have a smoother C curve. All of these are going to have different lengths of toe. So again, where that toe would break, oops, sorry about that, here. So the length of the toe coaches for track um, based on the blade is going to tell me my potential to get good knee drive on the opposite side. Okay, so when you're thinking not all running feet are designed the same. Some of these blades match better what we'd want in a sprinter. Some are better for mid distance, some are better long distance. Depending on the running technique, so people who are long striders, you know, we want to match that other side. So there's a lot that goes into this. So again, with those CAF grants or your decisions for your athletes, please keep in mind that all these feet are designed differently. So it's what, how does that athlete move um, to help match that? We talked a little bit already about the stiffness. Um, the thing I like to mention for my elite runners, typically their sockets. Um, so again, the part that connects to that residual limb is typically going to be a lot tighter than what they'd normally use for walking because it allows that stump or residual limb to push into it faster to allow me to take a quick and have better turnover. Okay, so we, as a soccer athlete in college, I always wore cleats a little bit smaller because it improved my timing and my touch. We have the same thing and same principles in mind for sockets. Again, because with running, we're coming down with more forces, we need the thickness of the foot for running to be thicker than what they would use for normal walking because the forces are different. And typically, um, depending on the sports, um, so for long jump, again, think about the forces as you're going through there is really different for that type of jumping than just running. Um, so the other big thing to mention about um, running prostheses is the height. So when someone has a unilateral amputation, our goal is that when that prosthetic blade is compressed, 
So when they're standing on that prosthetic slide and they have their full body weight through, that their pelvis stays level. If the prosthetic leg is too short or there's not enough stiffness, it can make that pelvis drop. So that's where you can see when they're running that there's all this extra movement up here in the trunk. So typically for people with unilateral amputations, we start with the prosthesis being an inch and a half taller than the other side. But again, that's gonna vary person to person. That's a rough ballpark. Um, so we allow that so that during running and the demands of that sport, we keep that pelvis level to not waste extra energy. We want the energy to go forward. Um, when someone is bilateral, we do have to keep in mind the sport rules for the maximum allowable standing height. And I saw Pam Carey here and she, um, I will defer all questions about MASH to her because it breaks my heart a little bit to talk about. <sighs> um, but there are rules we have to, whether I think they're wise or not, we have to adhere to. So um, those are things to keep in mind. Anything else, Mark? I wanted to jump back on, on the, the socket a little bit. Yeah. That's something that um, you know, isn't really thought of much when you're just trying to coach your athlete, but all of the body changing morphics that we're kind of talking about with dehydration and as we're kind of moving through and as we're expanding muscles as we're, go as we're going through or any kind of motion we're trying to uh, accommodate for happens within the prosthetic device too. And the unfortunate part is I'm making a static device for your dynamic athlete. So that socket can't change with them as they're flexing their muscles and it can't change with them as their limb gets smaller because they're dehydrating. So you have to be very aware of what's going on and if you do need a, an, a relief area within that socket and the fit to be maintained. You know, if we're just sprinting 100 yards, probably not a big deal, but if we're running a marathon triathlete, huge deal. Uh, so we have to be able to create not only the stability and performance, but also so the adaptability in the devices for longer distance and going through and, and you know anybody that's losing that that control of the prosthesis well they they can't perform like they really want to so having that ability to train with a prosthetist is crucial and being able to videotape that so we can change the shape so we can move the toe and then also figure out you know what's happening when the socket when the residual limb does change within that socket and how do we have to accommodate for that so those are all big parts of that and again, you know, the biggest thing for running technique is again, that opposite knee drive is gonna be limited um, by the shape of the blade, but also the angle with which it's attached relative to the socket. So that's something we want to maximize because speed is all about the frequency of my steps and how big of a stride I can take. So that's really the part where we want to, before we choose a specific design for that foot, we really want to know that athlete and how they move to really choose the foot that matches their movement pattern. Um, so we can do the same approach for every sport. So again, if you think about javelin, uh, javelin's a great example because it has a running component at the beginning, right? But the running isn't straight ahead. So now we have a little bit of side motion or your crossover step, which might be the approach the athlete chooses. So our ideas for alignment for a normal walking straight ahead are not going to be a good match for javelin. Just like that running prosthesis alignment for javelin wouldn't make sense because I don't want the body to go that direction. I still want it to move towards the target, but at an oblique angle. But besides, you know, in that beginning, that approach and those initial steps, those crossover steps, I want to build up speed. But then I need the device to turn around and provide stability so that I can release on top of it. So depending on your athlete, you might choose to pick a design that favors either the buildup speed or that favors the stability at the end. So this is where the coaching piece comes into play. You have someone that is just tremendously strong but slow. We want to maximize that speed because they already have the power. Um, and we'll see that in examples here. Um, so again, here's a video of someone who is, was not using a device, just for people who weren't familiar with maybe what the javelin looks like. But I wanted to take some time to look at these still photos um, to talk about differences. So I hate to pick on our Team USA athletes, so Canada gets the short end of the stick here. Uh, so we're going to look at two of them. So with both of them, you see that they're right-handed. 
and they have a prosthesis on their left leg and they both are amputated um, below the knee or what we call a transtibial amputation because it's through the shin bone. But you'll notice they have very different devices. So this first, um, this larger gentleman here, you can probably imagine is that example I just gave of someone who probably has great power. You know, he's, he's what I call a good field build. Um, he's just designed to have that kind of rotational strength, that probably explosive power. And they decided to go with the kind of traditional running blade for him because they likely wanted to optimize his buildup speed before he got to the point where he's actually trying to release the implement. And if you notice, when he's releasing, all of his weight is on his back leg because that prosthesis is not going to help him much um, to get his weight shifted. He is just launching off of that back leg. The other photo that we have is an athlete who does not have a running blade. But what you'll notice, if we look at the angle of that socket versus the foot, his foot is completely flat on the floor. So he has a good base of support, but it's angled, which means that the components they chose at that ankle allow for directions and multiple planes of movement. So for him, they were probably trying to optimize his stability at release so that he could really keep his weight and shift it from that back leg to that front leg to help control. So two totally different solutions, but this is where it's not, we have to understand what javelin is about and what motions are desired, but then we have to figure out what the athlete needs to enhance their performance. So how, how can we improve how far they can throw it by either giving more speed or more stability? So, there isn't one right solution, it's about matching it to the athlete. Um, I just have a couple more slides. So I um, wanted to show you a couple of our USA athletes. So discus is a very complicated motion, um, but this first video is going to be an example of someone who is left-handed and has an amputation on the opposite side. Okay, so we'll look at how this looks and hopefully the video will play. Let me go out of presentation mode. Um, I think we'll, we'll come back to those and I'll go in a different view so you can see. But again, depending on if I'm throwing with my right hand and my prosthesis is on the opposite or same side, might change the demands on what I need that device to be able to do for support. So that's another thing we wanna think about. While Everyone with a below knee, with a unilateral below knee amputation might be in the same sport competition group. It does not mean they have the same demands because depending on what side of the body or how long it is, um, how tall they are, all of those things will change the design of the device. So that's Jeremy Campbell there, um, but we'll come back to him. Um, if you guys haven't seen Marcus Ream, the blade jumper, again, we'll come back to him. He jumps actually off his prosthetic side and he, his record is 8.4 meters. So he's a beast. Um, and he's one of those that has opened the door for controversy, but truthfully, he's just a phenomenal athlete. Um, another one just to look at, what I like about this video, so this is an example of a doubles competition at Rio. So um, these are all standing athletes. Some um, have orthotic needs, some have prosthetic needs, so it's a really mixed group. But again, you can see how their movement style, we'll get to see them behind the table a little bit here. So again, we have a um, prosthetic leg over here, um, and right here, he's the one I showed you earlier. So you're gonna see very different movement profiles, but for the sport, they need to be in that athletic position, so they need to get low, right? How they choose to stand and how they choose to cover changes by the athlete. So it's not the classification, it's not the impairment, it's how that athlete also their style of play. So we don't ever want to just think about the medical diagnosis, we don't wanna just think about the right or left side. We also wanna think about style of play and how the device can help that athlete execute their chosen strategies to compete. Um, so again, as you're watching that athlete right here, 
um, watch him in between plays and you can see what I talked about with that leg length discrepancy that he, he doesn't walk well because this is a sport specific device. He plays fantastic because it's at the height he needs for athletic position. But when he walks to pick up a ball after, he, he doesn't do it well because it's not designed for that. Um, the last thing I just wanted to show you guys was just a list of resources. So if you don't have a prosthetist or orthotist that you're working with, um, there is a great directory that's available um, to reach out. I will tell you that most people um, really in, in the field would love to learn more about adaptive sports. So it won't take much um, arm wrestling to get them there. Uh, they tend to be uh, quite like, like the rest of us, very obsessed with it. So invite them to come watch, um, talk to them in the stands, make sure they're seeing what you're seeing, share your expertise. Um, there are great uh, resources here again for upper limb types of devices that are commercially available for sport and recreation. And again, our contact information is here. If you guys have questions that you want to talk about um, besides kind of this online uh, live format, we're definitely open to that. I assumed Mark was, I just put his email address. He's not very shy, so I'm pretty sure we're okay. Um, and just to point out our logo, if you notice, there's an orthosis on the Toro's front leg and a prosthesis on the back leg. Whoa, that's how nerdy we are. Um, so with that said, I wanna open it up for anyone who has any questions, um, and then I will exit out of the presentation mode and, and try to play those videos that didn't work. Yeah, well, Jen's getting the, the, the videos up too. I, I kind of wanted to make a point of something that we instill in our students here at uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills is fail forward. We, we, want, we want there to be no restriction on trying something new. And this is where we get caught into a lot of things because classic orthotics and prosthetics really don't apply to adaptive sports. And if you have that mentality of, oh, my AFO works for this walking device for this person, and you try to make that, force that on an athlete, it's not gonna happen. So if you let us fail, we'll make you the best device we possibly can. So we have to go through iteration one, two, seven, eight, 10, 12 to get there, but we need to change things and, and make things differently and, and try to work together on how it's gonna happen so it won't happen as quickly as some people need it to happen, but um, if we can work at it, it'll definitely happen. Thanks, Jen and Mark. So while we're waiting, I'll go ahead and um, throw out a couple of questions that we have. So one is what type of suggestions or um, things can you, Get, what kind of tips can you give those uh, physical therapists or physical therapy students who are interested in becoming involved in orthotics and prosthetics or even just the adaptive sports field in general? Well, I feel like I paid someone for that question. So thank you so much for that. Um, so within the American Physical Therapy Association, which is the national governing body for physical therapy, Within the sports section, which is now the Academy, uh, the American Academy of Sports Physical Therapy, there is an adaptive sports special interest group. So please join up. I happen to be the co-chair. Um, so we try to provide specific education um, at conferences like CSM or Mark and I are presenting at an orthotic and prosthetic um, meeting later in the fall about sports specific um, orthotics and prosthetics. In addition, there are um, uh, amputation special interest groups in both the federal section um, and there is a kind of learning group in the acute care section. So there are great resources within the physical therapy profession to learn about adaptive sports or to learn general things about orthotics and prosthetics. But we also love our collaboration days. Um, I, I, we do a lot with other PT programs around us. So hopefully you can find a program by you or how I got into orthotics and prosthetics was just bugging orthotist prosthetists and doing a lot of co-treatments. Um, when I worked at Sharpery Steely in San Diego, I would go to people's clinics. I would do PT there with the orthotist prosthetist and we try to problem solve issues. 
So again, horses, prosthetists, if they know you're a PT that's interested, they will be very excited to meet you, right, Mark? I, I've never had someone be like, oh, I'm not interested. They're like, when can you come this week? I have someone for you. And I'm like, oh, great. And then it goes the, the other way too. If you if you find that you have a, a, a person that's needing an orthotic or prosthetic device and that orthos process doesn't want to come to the track or doesn't want to come to one of the training events, then try to find somebody else uh, because they're typically really interested and want to do this and kind of way outside of the, the, the cost of the device and doing it on their own. So they're usually very interested in this and, and pulling ahead. And one of the things that we like to doing too is you know starting to think of some more telemedicine and if you have a program that's out there and you want to collaborate with our students we can do assessments together and it doesn't can be anywhere in the world so we can get a couple students together and try to figure out how we can do a treatment plan for that particular person see what modalities are, are going to work for them and see what devices we can create yeah and again events like this with glassa doing this virtual conference in lieu of covid and canceling Move United, um, which will be the parent of our Adaptive Sports USA and Disabled Sports USA, have tons of programming. So if this is something you're interested in, we can try to continue to help bridge those gaps. Awesome. Thanks for those resources. Mm -hmm. um, another question we got is what type of a time frame do you typically uh, anticipate with getting a prosthetic or an orthotic? That's a, that's a really weighted question. That one. Um, it all depends on where you're at in the, in the game. The device itself really doesn't take a long time to create, especially if we're going to be duplicating an existing type of socket for a start. Um, it's going to be the trial and error part of it. Uh, so, it, you know, so a kind of typical uh, new amputation that might happen for someone, it's up to about a month to two months to let the limb size kind of stabilize and, and get uh, strong enough to be able to handle a prosthetic device. Uh, but if you're seasoned and you've been a person that utilizes a prosthesis for, for a couple of years now and we're just making a new one, it could happen in a week. It all depends on kind of how, what we're looking for and what we're looking to do. If, they, if the prosthesis is making it in-house themselves or they're sending it out for another fabrication facility or if it's a really unique component, those things might take a little bit longer. You know, if you're asking one of the manu foot manufacturers to make a really super duper specific prosthetic foot that we don't typically normally have, that might take a little bit longer time. But um, yeah, make sure you give some time. If you, if you have a huge event coming up, don't come a week before and think it's going to be perfect. Uh, you know, you got to go a couple months before to make sure you can do the trial and error part. And again, I, I highly encourage that people, if they have an orthosis or prosthesis, that they learn the fundamentals of the sport movements on their daily device that they're comfortable with that is probably a little more stable before you just jump into um, going to a sport specific device. So the hardest thing for um, prosthetic runners is learning to stop. Um, so if you don't have a nice grass field or a ball pit or something to just kind of fall into, um, that's something that you probably don't want to do the first time on a track with a really short um, distance to the fence um, because that does not end well or bleachers or things like that. So it's good to learn how to do those body motions for sport first before you get all of that energy return that you have to control on a sport specific device. And some of the complex parts of it, like cycling, you know, one of the big things that I, I, I get with my athletes is what are we going to do? Are we going to utilize this prosthetic device for power or just for motion? And if we're using it for power, do we change the angle of the socket? Do we change where the toe clip is on the pedal? Do we change the crankshaft itself? And that's mm -hmm. something that, you know, I didn't know at all. In the beginning part, I was trying to get, just get alignment right there. And then we changed the crankshaft to two inches yep. shorter and it was awesome. So it's being able to combine all those things in the device itself and, the, and again, the trial and error getting there. And I, I love the question uh, here from Stephanie too about like how to help an athlete find the right sport. Um, this, I wish there was a better answer because typically uh, whatever region you're in is known for certain sports. Like they might have a really well-developed program and that's how people get their foot in the door for adaptive sports. Um, but just being around, I like to recommend the sport based on their body type, um, based, you know, so if they have a, you know, nice broad shoulders and long arms, um, and they're good in the water, I'd be like, you should be a swimmer, right? There's certain body type things that fit in together. So 
if you're built for fields and you want to, um, you know, to be a, a track sprinter, you can train a lot, but there's kind of an edge. And I'm six foot one. Um, not, I could want to do gymnastics, but there's going to be a point where my body is just going to get in the way. Um, so that's what I think we can do a better job of is making more education about what these sports are and who can be successful. But again, um, to start with, we just want everyone to be active and involved. Uh, but for those dreaming of getting on the podium, um, there are some special considerations that come with just knowing the sport. So that's something I think we can all do to improve. But um, the best thing we can do is let people know these sports exist, um, connect them to resources and see, you know, if there's someone who likes contacts, I'm not going to tell them about swimming, right? I'm going to be like, hey, uh, have you heard of sled hockey? Have you heard of wheelchair lacrosse? Have you heard of wheelchair basketball? Um, you know, these are, these are great sports that are really heavy contact that you'll probably love. Awesome. So we have a couple more uh, that we'll go through and then we'll have time for Jen to show us her couple of videos still. Um, another one is coming from Beth. Do you ever partner with the different VAs? So far, her experience has been that you have to fit within a box and, and though never goes into thinking outside the box. So yeah, um, I guess I have been, you know, uh, lucky enough to do a lot with military adaptive sports programs um, as a classifier, um, as well as um, helping with some coaching. So we're trying to get better there. Um, a lot of the, um, you know, the VAs have their own sport programs, but a lot of, I know Glassa, I know Angel City, I know a lot of programs really try to make collaborative competitions to allow that integration. Um, it, as far as uh, providing specific, specific orthotics and prosthetics, I'll let Mark kind of take it over, but our program in particular used to actually be located in the Long Beach VA, so we have a history there, um, as well as some great connections with um, other people that a lot of our alumni, and we even have several uh, students who are in their residencies at VAs. Um, so we're hoping to change that outside the box thinking, Beth. Um, but knowing you and what a good advocate you are, I hope you are also encouraging your practitioners and telling them what you need because you are very articulate and you know the sport really well um, to tell them what you need to improve that. So turn it back to you. So Mark, did you want to take a stab at that question too? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because there's so many VAs out there and they are mm -hmm. going to be the ones that are going to be kind of old school and, and just here's your ambulation device, not your sport specific device. Um, and it's, it's kind of, the VAs tend to not attract kind of forward thinking practitioners a lot. Um, so that's where most VAs will actually have outside practitioners service the, the vets that are in the area. So if we're talking, um, you know, recent military and DOD, and it's a way different story because they're getting everything you know under the sun that they they, they want to try out and it's great because they can try all, all these different things but a typical va is not going to get a very high-end component to be able to do athletics with um again that philosophy is definitely changing it's changing here the va long beach definitely changing in san diego um locally for us out here i know heinz has been very active uh, with that in, in, in illinois um but there's other ones that are really antiquated and it's really hard to kind of push the the philosophy of hey recreation is good and not bad and it's going to make them better going to go through so mm -hmm. let's find that so when you're in a situation like that if you're running into a uh, something that you can't get funding for these are typically the ones where the process orthos can take the existing device or existing mold and duplicate it and save a lot of components and then there's things that we can borrow or use or go through caf or other you know organizations to be able to try to find those components and hopefully the practitioner can donate their time to be able to get the alignment down and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And again, there's great, you know, companies like amputee blade runners, lots of great nonprofits that are trying to help because insurance doesn't always cover sport specific prosthetics and orthotics, whether you are uh, someone in the VA system or in the civilian system. Um, so that's something we all need to work for, but the best thing we can do is just keep being a voice and an advocate for ourselves and for other people that are in need um, to make sure people know how important these things are. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, yeah. Go ahead, Jen. Oh, I was just gonna answer this last question unless you want me to play the videos. 
So I had one more. Well, we have one that's posted there and then I had one more, which one's kind of fun. Um, so the last one I have here is what is the most challenging case you've had prosthetic or orthotic that you've had to make or work on? Hmm. For sport specific. Yes. Um, well, I think, you know, when you talk about like for prosthetics, more proximal levels of amputation are always challenging. So someone with a hip disarticulation where they don't have any of the lower leg muscles, they just have a pelvis, um, because you need to replace the ankle, knee and hip joints. Um, and the technology for sport specific applications is really limited. Um, so that's where we go a little bit more low tech and creative. Um, as well as, again, people with multiple impairments are, are really the big challenge. So health conditions such as arthrogryposis, um, where there is a loss of strength and a loss of range of motion, we have to be very creative with what we can do for solutions. So um, it might involve modification of the sport equipment as opposed to modifications to the athletes. Um, and I, I think while those are challenging, those are always the most fun. Um, because you get to think and um, again it's just such a fun collaborative thing so I don't know Mark if you have specifics I have definitely some specific ones um, but <laughs> most, the most fun challenging ones have been uh, a lot of the animals that I've, that I've worked with uh, winter uh, which is you know the dolphin tail was one of the ones that we got to work on and try to get back swimming but uh, 1500 pound Clydesdale was another one that's another one trying to get back running and not just kind of ambulating with that uh, so a lot of different animals on, on that end. But uh, the most challenging athlete was a uh, gentleman who was a scratch golfer. Sorry, my lights are going out here. Um, it was a scratch golfer and had a uh, situation where they put him in a medically induced coma and he lost circulation to his hands and his feet. So he was a partial amputation on his hand, a full wrist disarticulation on his other hand, a partial foot amputation on his left side, and a ankle amputation on his right side. Uh, so getting him back to golf was uh, one of the things. And I saw him in the hospital and you know, I said, mm -hmm. you know, this is going to be a problem. We're going to get you back there. And it was a tremendous problem because gripping the club with one hand and those devices that you might have seen, it's pretty easy. But trying to grip the club with two artificial hands is uh, very, very difficult. And then the balance part of it and then the rotation and pivoting on your feet. So that had been the most technically challenging one that took about two years to get him back to getting under a hundred handicap underneath there. So, so that was a definitely a technically challenging one. Yeah. Wonderful. So then the last question we have is uh, from Stephanie. I see that you have quite a bit of data on the angles. How is this data being collected? Oh, so that's a great question, Stephanie. Um, so there's a lot of technology to record joint motions. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those are limited to be able to capture at the rate required for sport. So while we have body-worn sensors and we have motion capture, they really kind of struggle to have the resolution to do running. So most of the um, Running information is from instrumented treadmills or force plates that look at the ground reaction forces and how the body's interacting with the ground um, to tell us about some of that. But there, you know, there's, there's tons of technology out there, but for sports, because athletes move in such precise, fast motions, uh, we are more limited for research, which is the problem with some of these rules that we can't, um, we can't, we don't have the sophistication to prove that these rules make sense or don't make sense for Paralympics. So this is really where the science meets everything else. So um, I just wanted, I pulled up um, from YouTube this video of Marcus Ream. Um, so if you guys haven't got to see him, again, a phenomenal athlete. So a right um, baloney amputation, which we call a right transtibial amputation. Um, you're gonna see it in fast motion. Again, this is the long jump. So it's all about speed at the beginning and then it's about getting that proper aerodynamic form at the takeoff but he takes off of his prosthetic side and that's 8.4 meters he did here in Doha um, so you're gonna see it in slow motion here in a little bit but this is one of the people that gets brought up when people say so look there he takes off the prosthetic side 
but just textbook form. You can see a little bit of the drift because of the weight difference between the legs. Um, but again, there is no reason we can't get Paralympic athletes up to a phenomenal level um, with proper training and having a device that's really designed for sport. So he happens to work for one of the um, prosthetic manufacturers. So I think he uh, is well sponsored and has different legs for the different events he does. Um, and I know that's not something we can really do at the grassroots level, but if we know an athlete um, really has potential to get to that next level, sometimes the device design uh, can really be that thing that helps highlight their true athletic ability. And that's one big thing to, you know, the point to bring out is none of these devices produce power. They absorb power and return some of it. Some. The mm -hmm. blade itself maybe returns 87% of the power he puts into it. So, you know, that's it's always such a joke when you kind of, you hear these you know, advantages that these individuals have that they, they give, do 250% power with your gas truck, but you can do yeah. 25% with a prosthetic. So how do you, how do they have an advantage? Mm -hmm. So again, you know, there's no way we can cover all the nitty gritty parts here, but I hope that all of you see that regardless if you're an athlete, a coach, um, a sport official, you can contribute to this conversation um, and really help, or again, a, a healthcare provider. If you, you know, we heard from some student physical therapists or physical therapists, um, you can contribute to this conversation because all of us know that sport performance and high level is really about efficiency of the human movement. So the device is a piece of that. It doesn't replace training. It doesn't replace anything else. All of these have to come together. But regardless of who you are on this call, your opinion, your observations are an important voice to contribute to these decisions. And again, there isn't one choice. Awesome. Thank you again, Jen and Mark. We really appreciate your time here. And thank you all for attending the Great Lakes Games virtual Great Lakes Games this year. We hope you'll join us later on this week for some more sessions that we're offering. All right, thanks.